Hey Krishna. Hey. Sanjay Prabhu is back here. And today I will speak on the topic of audacity in devotional service. Audacity. Audacity is the word has a negative connotation. That somebody who is Hindi is a chota mu badi baat. That somebody is in an insignificant position, that person speaks big words. So, here, Prithu Maharaj in his prayers to Lakshmi Devi is in prayers to Lord Vishnu is saying that actually, my dear Lord, you take my side in case Lakshmi Devi gets angry with me. So, he is being quite audacious, quite presumptuous. He is saying that I have got a service which Lakshmi Devi is, which now normally she does, and you take my side. So we'll try to analyze the, the devotional psychology of a devotee while serving the Lord. So I'll speak this in three points. And after each point, I'll invite some reflections. If any of you would like to, any point that struck you or any point that you found relevant, you can speak that. The three points I'll speak is that first, how what exactly is humility when we are trying to serve the Lord? Then how audacity can also be used in the service of the Lord? And how, lastly, the essential bhakti is not humility nor audacity, but it is purity. It is service attitude, pure service attitude. So normally, the first point is that we talk about humility. So, humility essentially means that we don't let our ego come in the way of our service. Humility is often seen as, especially in today's world, as something which is self-demeaning, which is negative, which is psychologically damaging. Many people say that actually you should develop self-esteem. And yes, self-esteem is important. But even more important than self-esteem is esteem for something bigger than the self. For we all, yes, if we feel that I am worthless, I am useless, I am helpless, yes, that's, that's kind of beating ourselves mentally is not good. But the opposite, I am so great, I am so powerful, I am so smart, that is also not very good. No, that's also not healthy. So actually, the cure for self-esteem is not self-infatuation. Self it is actually esteem for something bigger than oneself. When we have some purpose to live for, which is bigger than ourselves, that is what actually brings a sense of meaning to our life. When we take up some responsibility bigger than ourselves, some responsibility for something bigger than ourselves, that's when our life becomes meaningful. So, in general, the sense of meaning and purpose in our life are proportional to the sense of responsibility that we take up. So, suppose somebody is in a house that is on fire and they are trying to find out a way to run away from the house and it's all there, a firefighter outside. Now, everybody will be trying to run out on their own. But there is one small child somewhere over there. People who are there inside also be conscious this child is there. You know, I can take this child and you know, go together. So when you take up responsibility for something other than oneself, that is when our, our self-conception, our consciousness expands. As long as we are thinking only of ourselves, then consciousness doesn't expand. It shrinks. Either I am so great, or, I am so greatly troubled, I am so greatly victimized. So either way, uh, when we talk about humility, as said, humility means to not let our ego come in the way of our purpose. So we have some purpose, for a devotee that purpose is ultimately to serve Krishna. And let the ego come in the way means that whether I get respect or I don't get respect. I am going to serve Krishna no matter what happens. So in that sense, humility is not about how fallen I am. 
Yes, that is a part of it. But the essence of humility is, okay, I am not self-obsessed. You know that last time Vishla Prabhupada, once a devotee came to Prabhupada and said, Prabhupada, I am the most fallen. And Prabhupada said, you are the most nothing. You are just insignificant. You have to say, I am most fallen could also be a perverse kind of ego. Oh, I am more fallen than humans. No, Prabhupada, you just insignificant. So, the idea in bhakti is to stop being self-centered. In fact, if you consider the 12th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, where Krishna uses a hierarchy or a ladder of various levels that you can connect from, connect with him. The highest in 12.8, he says is, just live absorbed in me. Mayeva mana atasva maivadhyam nivesaya nivasishya si mayeva atavudvamna samchayana so with your mind and keep absorbed me, live in me. The next he says, if you can't do that, Tachittam Samadha Tum Nishat Nausi Maistiram Abhyasa Yogi Vidato Maamichap Tum Nanjayam And back to Sadhana Bhakti. Then do Abhyasa, disciplined fixing of the mind of me. And if you can't do that, then he says, Abhyasa Yogi Vidato Maamichap Tum Nanjayam And back to Sadhana Bhakti. 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 Then work for me. And he says, if you can't even work for me, if you can't do seva for me, so first is just pure devotion, absorption, then is conscientious sadhana bhakti, then seva. If you can't do that, then he says, Athaita dapya sattosi kartam matyodam ashita sarva karma falatyaga tatah kuru yata atma maan. So Krishna says, do some karma falatyaga. The idea is, tyaga chantiran antaram, as you'll say in the next verse. So the idea is, Come out of, <coughs> come out of yourself. Shreyo vijnanam abhyasa dhyana dhyanam vishishite dhyana karma phala dhyanam dhyana chantiran nitaram. So he says, come out of yourself. So the ultimate coming out of oneself is to be, to go into Krishna. Not in terms of merging, but in terms of absorption in service, absorption in love. But the basic point is, come out of yourself. So humility in bhakti is not just saying I am so fallen, I am so fallen. Essentially it is coming out of oneself. I am not so important that I have to keep thinking about myself constantly. There is something bigger than me that is worth thinking about. That is worth my thought, my emotion, my attention and let me focus on that. So somebody who has that attitude of focusing on something bigger than oneself that person automatically has humility. So, humility, is, this is the first point I was going to make. Humility essentially means to not let our ego come in the way of our service. So, <clears throat> if somebody is saying, I am so powerful, I am so great, how many people are respecting me? Uh, well, that's not a good attitude. So if I come into the temple, somebody comes into the temple, so seeing the Lord, that person simply says, who all is offering obeisances to me? I don't see anything else. Well, that is ego. But if somebody on the opposite side, somebody comes in the temple and just falls down and offers obeisance, that doesn't get up on me. So I'm so fallen, I just want to fall, fall down and offer obeisance. Well, get up and do some service. <laughs> Isn't it? So, <coughs> you know, so the ego, when it is too great, that can obstruct service. But if one is so self-centered, thinking that I'm so fallen, I'm so worthless, I'm so useless, then that is also unconducive to devotional service. That is also Pratikul. And Krishna said that is Pratikul, the Bhakti Rasamu Sindhu says that that is Pratikul, unfavorable, should be put aside. So, humility means to not let our ego come in the way of our purpose. That was the first point. So, any reflections on this? Any thoughts, anything that struck you, anything you would like to share somewhere you read or heard or anything similar? Yes, of course. So, yes, we say that 
You're supposed to think of us as a humble in a blade of grass. Then how can being humble in a blade of grass be related to this idea of humility? See, Prabhupada always says humility means not to not be conscious, to not be anxious to have a satisfaction of being honored by others. That's what he says in the 13th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. So the idea is we see devotees also speak very strong at times. Now let's put it this way. What is the purpose of Trunada Pisanjaya? The same verse itself if we take. The purpose of being humble in the blade of grass, being more tolerant in the day is being more tolerant in the tree is so that we can do Kirtaniya Sadhapari. So that we can become absorbed in glorifying Krishna. So the devotee is not constantly thinking, I am lower than the blade of grass, I am lower than the blade of grass. The devotee is thinking Krishna is so glorious, let me glorify him. Now, if for glorifying Krishna, a devotee has to take a prominent position or speak strongly, that is not against the principle of humility. So the idea of Trunadapi Sunichena is that so that we can do Kirtanya Sada. So we want to be humbler than a blade of grass. The mood over there is that I am not all that important. What is important is Krishna and Krishna's service. So let me not think so much about myself. Let me think about Krishna. If Trunada Pisanichena literally meant that no, I think of myself as completely insignificant, worthless, useless, then who do I think I am to glorify Krishna constantly? Where do I get the qualification from? I mean, if I say I'm not qualified, by mercy also. But even mercy has to be received in some receptacle. And if the receptacle is completely useless, then even that mercy cannot be received by the receptacle. So we are all parts of Krishna. And inherently, eternally, we are parts of Krishna. So that doesn't mean we are great. We are connected with the great. And that connection is re-established by our association with great souls. But with that connection, we are meant to serve. And the focus has to be on service. Focus has to be on the purpose. So yes, I am not so important. Now let me do, the, let me do what I can for serving Krishna. Okay? Thank you. So... Yes, sir. The point about self esteem, is there a Sanskrit equivalent of it or is just a point where the modern terminology is self esteem? Is that a false ego or self esteem? Okay, is self esteem similar to false ego as a Sanskrit word? <coughs> well, there is Swabhiman in Sanskrit, which is there's Abhiman, which is not considered good. Swabhiman is self respect, you could say. Now, it's ultimately not so much of uh, what word you, we use, but what the conception is. We normally, when Dhruva Maharaj is insulted or neglected by his uh, father and insulted by his stepmother, no, we don't really use the word ego over there. His ego, he, he is so ego, egoistic that he, he couldn't tolerate it. So broadly speaking, there are three terms in English. Again, you could use broadly use Sanskrit for that. But there is <coughs> there is arrogance, there is pra, there is pride, and there is honor. So the word arrogance almost always has a negative connotation. Mm -hmm. The word pride generally we talk about one of, as one of the six anarthas. Uh, last time the great enemy like that, but. Uh, the word pride sometimes have a positive connotation also. Say like sometimes you have a hotel in pride. Hotel pride or hotel executive pride or whatever. I have never seen any hotel in hotel arrogance. <laughs> arrogance usually has a negative connotation. Now honor on the other side has a positive connotation. So, mana bhangam amrushyatam, aho kshatri tejasam mana bhangam amrushyatam. In the Dhruva past time, the Narakuni is appreciating, just see what is the nature, what is the glory of Tejasam, what is the glory of the Kshatriyas, that they cannot tolerate dishonor. I mean, shouldn't we be tolerating dishonor? No, the Kshatriya psychology is made up in such a way that they cannot tolerate dishonor. But their sense of honor makes them act honorably. And that fear of dishonor stops them, deters them from dishonorable actions. So in that sense, if we consider yena kena prakarena mana So if our sense of honor makes us do the right thing, that may not be the purest motive, but we cannot expect 
to always have the purest motive while doing the right thing. Just like Akamaha Sarva Kamova, Moksha Kamoda, the Tivrena Bhakti Yogi, the Jesus Prashamba. The good thing is to worship Krishna. The best is that we do the right thing with the right motive. But if you cannot do the best, still it is good that you do the right thing even if it is not the right motive. Not, if, you, if you do the best thing, but not necessarily the best motive. So if a sense of honor can impel us to do the right thing, that is not considered ego. And in the letter of Sri Prabhupada also where he says that uh, some devotee had stopped following the principles and given up the practice of bhakti. So Prabhupada said, you had taken a vow before the deities, before the sacred fire, before the Vaishnavas, before the Guru. How can you break the vow like this? Don't you have a sense of honor? So a sense of honor means we have the idea of word of honor. So that what is the value of a person if they don't honor their own word? So the idea is that honor, if it can make us act honorably, then it is not a bad thing necessarily. So in that sense, self-respect or swabhuman, or self-esteem if you want to use that word. The word self-esteem might be a modern psychological term. But the concept that uh, we need to have a healthy attitude towards ourselves is quite very much there in the tradition. Now, what would be a healthy attitude? See, today, self-esteem is often thought of in isolation. That I am such a great person. Generally, in the tradition, self-esteem or sabhiman was seen in connection. That, you know, I belong to such a dynasty. I have such parents. Then how can I disres- how can I dis- bring disgrace upon them by behaving in a pro- improper way? Oh, I am a Kshatriya. Kshatriya is meant to protect people. I cannot injure people. I cannot exploit people. So generally, that sense came from a uh, that sense of honor came from our connectedness, and the ultimate connectedness would be Krishna. So if our sense of connection with Krishna makes us act honorably, if I behave in an improper way then it is Krishna who will be who will be defamed by that because I am presented in the world as a devotee of Krishna. So that if, if our sense of uh, honor and self-esteem or self-worth comes from our connection rather than from our sense of fragmentation that I alone am great and I don't I, I don't owe anything to anyone I alone am great and that makes me think that I am above everyone else then that is a problem. So, so let's move to the first point I discussed was that humility means that we don't let our ego come in the way of our service. The second point I discussed now is that <coughs> audacity can also be used in devotional service. Bhakti is so inclusive that almost everything can be used. Now, the word audacity if somebody is audacious, that means that they they sometimes speak inappropriately, they may speak dis- disrespectfully. Now, of course, words have sometimes negative connotation and positive connotation also. Nowadays, audacity is considered positive also. That somebody has the courage to speak the truth or courage to speak something, even if they may have to get some, they face difficulties out of it. So, it depends on connotation. Uh, and many words traditionally had negative meanings, nowadays have uh, positive meanings. Traditionally the word wicked meant cruel. So I was at a program, I was at a retreat in Chicago and we had a nice, uh, with some western people had come for that feast, I mean that for the whole retreat, so they had a nice feast. So I asked them, how was the prasad? I said, it was wicked. <laughs> what? <laughs> wicked? <laughs> <laughs> then I read a meaning. Wicked actually means it's, it's like a it's a teenage way of saying excellent. <laughs> so the meanings of word also change over time. But anyway, the word audacity sometimes has a positive connotation. Uh, now <coughs> sometimes a devotee may speak in a way that might seem presumptuous. But if that is so we may say, where is the humility in speaking like this? But if the intent is to serve, then there is humility over there also. So I'll take a uh, couple of examples, including the Prutumara example now. 
what is going on here. So in the first canto in Bhagavatam, when Bhishma is pacifying and uh, instructing Yudhishthira Maharaj, at that time he says, Tathapi kanta bhaktishu pashyabhupan kampitam yatme sustaja tamsaksha krishno darshinam agataha. So he says, Krishna Darshinam Agataha. To see, Krishna himself, Sakshat, has come to give me this Darshan. Pasha Bhupanu Kampitam. Just see the compassion, the mercy of, this, of the Lord, O King Bhupa, the protector of the earth. But the first line is, is puzzling. Tathapya Ekanta Bhakteshu. Therefore, just see the mercy of the Lord on his pure devotee. So, Bhishma is calling himself a pure devotee. Just say that being a, for a pure devotee, how merciful the Lord is. Now, we may say, what is going on? Maybe somebody comes with a label, pure devotee, offer Dandavats. <laughs> we may say, this is outrageous. Yeah, nobody, generally, we say pure devotees. They don't claim themselves to be pure devotees. We have Krishna Kaviraj Goswami saying that Jagai Madai Huite Muise Papishta, that I am more sinful than Jagai and Madai. So, how can a devotee say that I am, I am so exalted, that I am a pure devotee? Now, if you look at the context, you will understand the intent over there. See, the verse is saying, just see how merciful the Lord is to his pure devotee, to his unflinching devotee. The word pure can be used for the specific word. Is, Ekanta Bhakti one pointed, as I had, that he has come himself to give darshan. So, in the context, we see the purpose is not to glorify himself. The purpose is to glorify pure devotion and how pure devotion attracts extraordinary grace from the Lord. The idea is that Yudhishthira Maharaj over there is hesitant to ascend the throne. Because he feels that I was responsible for so much bloodshed. I was responsible for this massive Kurukshetra war. And I am guilty and I should commit atonement and not enjoy royal opulence. So the Bhishma's thread of thought over there is that sometimes the Lord may ask us to do difficult service. And if the difficult service we do unflinchingly, we will get rewarded. So Bhishma had to do the difficult service of fighting against the Lord. He had the difficult service of being on the side of the Kauravas who were against the Lord. So he did that service lifelong. And what was it? Again, the Lord gave him to the extraordinary reward. So Bhishma's departure is considered to be the best departure, the ideal departure. That's how a devotee aspires to depart from the world. Beholding the presence of the Lord, just the way Bharadas Thakur departed. So, what the point here is that unflinching devotion or pure devotion will, even if it is difficult, it will get an extraordinary reward. And therefore, practice pure devotion service. So, the point is not that I am a pure devotee, the point is he is using himself as an example to illustrate the glorious rewards that await those who practice pure devotion. So similarly, so here it could be used as audacious. How can you say that you are a pure devotee? But no, if the audacity can help a person to illustrate the principles of pure devotion, can help a person convince something, then audacity is also usable in devotional service. And Prutha Maharaj is here doing something similar. When he is saying here, and my dear Lord, I want such an intimate service for you. This is service normally done by Lakshmi Devi. So what is he saying over here? His mood is not that I am better than Lakshmi Devi. His mood is that, that I am not going, it's not that I am serving Lakshmi Devi and I am going to be the your intimate eternal associate. His mood is not to bypass or surpass. Bypass means to somebody is there, you go by the side. Surpass means to try to become better than them. His mood is not to bypass or surpass Lakshmi Devi. His mood is to highlight the mercy of the Lord. 
that body alone normally in the when the sacrifices are performed Prabhupada talks about this so in the sacrifices there is hierarchy sometimes the devtas they just come invisibly and just the sacrifice is completed without any mystical sightings sometimes the devtas come and generally the functional devtas come Dupa devtas sometimes indra might come very rarely they thought like Brahma and Shiva might come. If only the sacrifice is extraordinary, extraordinarily performed. But almost never does Vishnu come in a sacrifice. In fact, the society, so the darshan of Vishnu is so rare that even when the whole universe is in disruption, is disrupted, and then say the earth goes along with Devtas to Brahma, and Brahma prays, all the Devtas are there, the whole royal assembly there. Or celestial sun, not a royal sun. But even then, Vishnu can't be seen. Vishnu communicates directly to the heart of Brahma. And then Brahma gives the message. So, Brahma, the sight of Vishnu is extremely rare. But that Vishnu himself has come to this fire sacrifice. And he has come not only with the fire sacrifice. He has actually come and given his darshan and his personal association, his personal touch to his, his allowed Putu Maharaj to touch his lotus feet and to get his hands to touch his lotus feet, massage the lotus feet, to put his head over there, to offer his obeisances over there. This is such an extraordinary benediction. And that too he has given when the sacrifice also has not been complete. So, if we consider Putu Maharaj's situation, <coughs> say if we consider a cricket match, you know, if a player is 99 and the player gets out, it's such a tragedy. The player makes 100 and gets out, then everybody celebrates, he made 100 at least. So somebody is 99 and in India in cricket, one of the biggest, one of the most famous cricketers, he was on like 190 to 193 and at that time the captain declared. And these two players, after that, this Kitab player was so angry with that captain. He, they were the same team, they didn't talk for months and months after that. So, how could you declare that I was going to So, it's here, Krutu Maharaj is like himself the captain and he's a 99 and he declared himself. It's okay, I will not believe it. So, now, some, even if he had completed the 100 sacrifice, Yes, he would have got the fame that he completed a century of sacrifices, but nothing more. He completed 99 sacrifices and he got a result which he would not have got even after completing 100 sacrifices. That is, he got the darshan of the Lord, he got the sanity, the personal proximity of the Lord. Mm-hmm. So, here he says, How merciful you are, O Lord, that you, you have given me access to yourself. So, in transcendental mathematics, 99 is much greater than 100. So, <laughs> 99 is much, much greater than 100 for Prutu Maharaj because uh, with 100, you just have 100, okay, with 99, he had the Lord with him and the Lord is infinite. So, here Prutu Maharaj actually, when he's saying that Lakshmi will get angry with me, but he will take my side, he's not creating a dissension between Vishnu and Lakshmi, not at all. His mood is <coughs> in an audacious way, he is glorifying the glorifying the process of bhakti and the mercy of the Lord. And this mood, if you understand, then you will see how he could make such a presumptuous statement. When a devotee is audacious, the devotee is not audacious for because of ego. The devotee is audacious because of delight and jubilance in the Lord's glory, in the Lord's mercy. And when a devotee makes statements like this, we have to see the sentiment in the statement. No, the statement need not be literal. Literal means, it is not that Lakshmi is actually going to get angry. Not that Lord will have to choose between Lakshmi and Lakshmi and Maharaj. But, the sentiment over there. So, when Krishna Das Kuraj Goswami says in the Chaitanya Charita Amrit, that anybody who accepts Krishna as God but doesn't accept Chaitanya Mahaprabhu as God, that person is to be condemned, that person will go to hell. Now, that is a statement expressing his intense devotion. 
that is not a literal statement there can be states that there can be many great vaishnavas from other sampradayas who may worship krishna devotedly but may accept chaitanya mahaprabhu as a great sannyas as a great devotee and bhakti nada ko says that is also accepted if you, if you can be inspired by the process of love that is offered and you see in the flood of love that comes by following that process that is that is wonderful so but here in krishna karan goes on his business statement like that we have to see the sentiment it's that it's audacious how can actually anyone who is devoted to krishna go to hell but he say okay you are devoted to krishna the mood over there is that same krishna has come as lord chaitanya mahaprabhu is so merciful how can you neglect him how can you not access him on mercy how can you be so short sighted so it's a expression of devotional sentiment devotional efforts and we see it that way then we appreciate the sentiment without getting into an unnecessary argument about the logicality of the statement and so uh, as a second point the devotee can use audacity also in devotional service any reflections on this we said that darshan of vishnu is very very rare yeah but we also see that krishna has been with us for 25 years and everyone can see him for 25 years yes that's true that's all ram is here for 36000 years yeah that's true i agree so when the darshan of vishnu is very rare then what do we say about when the lord descends yes that's why the descent is a time of extraordinary mercy extraordinary mercy three aspects to it first is in the shri vishnu tradition there are different avatars that are talked about and they say that the lord in vaikuntha is like a uh, water in an ocean for somebody who is deep in land vaikuntha is so far away says the lord when he comes and sacrifices is like water in the clouds it's there but it's not reachable for us says that when the lord descends to this world it's like the rains as long as the lord is there water as long as the rains are there water is available profusely like that while the lord is there his darshan is available profusely and then they say the arch avatar the deity form of the lord is like the lake that is formed when the rains come so the lake always stays with us so like the deity is always stays that's how they say that the deity is the most accessible form of the lord so yes when the lord is there definitely is much more accessible than usual so the challenge is that not everybody accepts him as the lord at that time because many people like duryodhan and other think that he is just a extra or extraordinary prince my story the powerful warrior or something like that thank you so so if the deity is the lake what is the name of the lord which the name of the lord always in the center of the deity name of the lord who is name of the lord is always with us the parmatma yeah you could say i don't know whether this body will feel you know that yes <clears throat> we could say that the water that is always nourishing our body always the water is always there in our heart in our physical body that's how our life is maintained the super soul is also maintaining us like that so that could be a extension of the body thank you mm. so now let's go to the last point i was going to say that so bhakti centers on purity purity means simply the desire to serve purity is not actually anything abstract purity simply means that we have many many desires in our heart but purity means that the desire to serve krishna is the most prominent so many other desires might be there but as purification happens the desire to serve krishna becomes stronger and stronger just like say if we have a computer screen open with many many windows which are minimized or adequate sometimes we have these big screens where you may have multiple windows open and they are all at different degrees of magnification and then depending on what is important then a particular window is maximized and it zooms out so like that uh, in our consciousness right many many windows are open and there are many impure desires also there are many practical things also we have to do and there is the desire to serve krishna also so for as we become purified the desire to serve krishna that window becomes bigger and bigger and bigger 
that window not only becomes bigger but it stays bigger so purity is we can see it more as a uh, analog progression rather than simply a digital state like i am pure like there pure devotee and not pure devotee you know seeing it like that we are all at varying degrees of purity on one journey on one continuum on one spectrum so from impurity to purity it's not like one quantum leap it's small steps that we take at every moment that we try to focus on krishna try to focus on serving krishna it's like there are many windows open but we focus on the window that is there that is of service to krishna and this is uh, most software is a, a, a self learning feature to it if you open a particular window repeatedly that's the window that becomes default so like that if we consciously cultivate the desire to serve krishna then gradually what is done consciously now will be done spontaneously eventually and this is how this is the essence of purification is that it transforms the consciousness into the spontaneous so consciousness means my mind wants to go here my mind wants to go there wants to go there but consciously i bring it to krishna i focus on the desire to serve krishna i have many desires but i am here to serve krishna when we come to a temple you know, we may have so many thoughts that some devotee with whom we are angry some devotee with whom we are irritated some devotee with whom some with some devotees we may have uh, hot war going on with some devotees we may have cold war going on mm-hmm. we have all kinds of dynamics and actually if you see that devotee who might feel a little annoyed feel a little irritated feel angry also but okay i have come to them take darshan of krishna to sir krishna yes the devotee is there and i don't i can't suddenly wish away that feeling just like if some window is open we can't just let it go but i am not like that so just that conscientious effort if we do let me focus on serving krishna right that itself that choice itself is is going to purify us so purification is something not like an event that will happen in the future yes, it will happen no doubt but it's not just that purification is a choice that we can make at every moment by focusing on the desire to serve krishna when we have the desire to serve krishna then we know when to use when to use humility in krishna's service and when to use audacity in his service and as we march purposefully towards krishna in all our situations so i'll summarize i spoke on the theme of <coughs> humility audacity and purity in bhakti so humility means then you remember essentially not let our ego come in the way of our purpose so it or how self esteem lack of self esteem is a problem but lack of esteem for something bigger than self can be a bigger problem also so the idea is a sense of meaning and purpose comes in our life to the extent we take responsibility for something bigger than ourselves and the biggest reality is krishna so humility means that not i am so fallen nor i am so great it is that i am not so important that i have to keep thinking of myself let me think of krishna and the service krishna and in that mood humility becomes a very valuable tool for focusing on something bigger than ourselves and second point was audacity a devotee can even speak audaciously or act audaciously if that is what is required in service of krishna and uh, i took three examples vishnu pitama saying that i am a pure devotee to glorify how pure devotion gets extraordinary rewards prithu maharaj speaking that you know that i am almost like displaced lakshmi devi he saying that to illustrate how much how extraordinary is the mercy that he has been bestowed and how merciful the lord is and krishna was was one saying that anybody who rejects chaitanya mahaprabhu is condemned this a audacious proclamation of devotion it is not literal but it is it is indicates the magnitude of the mercy uh, it's not always literal and last point was that by having purity we can know when to use humility and when to use audacity in krishna's service so purity or pur- purification which is the process of purity is not just a state it is a process and every moment when you choose to focus on the desire of krishna and so so many other things that might be open on the monitor of our mind by that choice 
we are moving towards purification. So, what is conscientious devotion leads to spontaneous devotion through purification. And when we have that, we strive to keep the desire to serve Krishna strongest in our consciousness, then uh, we will know how to serve him in what situation, whether to use humility or whether to use audacity or how, it's, how to move forward. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Is there any one question? Yes, please. Okay. You were mentioning at the last time about purity. Purity means that you can differentiate between the desires of Krishna and the material desires. But then you move from the desires of Krishna also with some different desires of Southern Krishna in particular. That is helpful. Okay. So within our desire to serve Krishna, also there are so many desires to serve Krishna in particular ways. Uh, there is always the challenge that we are individuals and bhakti is not about denying our individuality. Bhakti is about channeling our individuality. So, uh, how best we can serve Krishna? that we have to find out through a process of self-observation and consultation with others. So if we have a desire to serve Krishna in a particular way, that is not at all wrong, that is not material, it is not by default material. It could just be that that is the best way we can serve. If somebody has good singing ability, they want to sing for Krishna, then that is good. So I was in Calgary and I the Lord is asking this, People's service attitude about and how we should all be ready to do menial services. And I spoke on that, I spoke on philosophy, and then after that, my devotee came and says, How is it that before me another visitor had come, and before that another visitor had come, and all three of us, all three of us spoke on the same topic? So, what had happened was the management had been telling them the devotees are not doing menial services, so all visitors they were telling them about people. <laughs> So, <laughs> it became a little odd. So, 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 so then the man, I was talking to the managers over there, they were saying that uh, actually everybody wants to do classes or do pujari worship, but nobody wants to do say a temple hall cleaning or vessel washing or other services like that. So now there could be that certain, certain particular devotee services who does in the limelight. Mm-hmm. Certain services, just like in material life, certain careers get glamorized. Sometimes in the ocean, certain services get glamorized. And everybody wants to do the glamorous service. And there you could say it's, it's because of ego. There might be some contamination of ego over there. So, uh, we should be ready to do whatever service we are told. And if, uh, if a particular service is uh, required, even if it is difficult, Bhakti Sanskrit would say that where there is greater need, there is greater mercy. So if nobody wants to clean the dungeon, nobody wants to wash the vessel, and if we take it up, we get more mercy over there. So in that sense, just wanting to do services which bring us in the limelight, which are glamorized, that you could say is a somewhat egoistic desire. But having said that, there are different devotees who have been blessed by Krishna in different ways. So ultimately the test of what service we should do is, what service gives us the most absorption. So, the appreciation we get for a service is not as defining or is not as inspiring for sustainable devotional service as the absorption we get in service. So, somebody might get absorption in giving classes, and somebody might get absorption in just making garlands or cleaning the temple or washing the vessels. So, the absorption is more important. If somebody is not, if somebody is washing vessels and they are constantly wanting the whole world to know, say, I wash so many vessels. So that means they are not getting any connection with Krishna. And somebody is giving classes and they are constantly anxious. How many people come? How many people are in my classes? Or oh, they are always calculating, you know, so many people came for my class, how many people came for that person's class. So there is no absorption over there. So we drag, so if we just go for a service which is glamorous or we avoid a service which is difficult, that could be self-centered consideration, but not necessarily. We have to see ultimately what is the service that we can get absorbed in the most. And if we can, if we have a desire to do that service, 
then with humility we can express it. You know, I I I, I think I need to push on this service. I forget everything else, my distractions go away. Can I do the service more? And ultimately our authorities, our guides, they also want us to make things but things are sustainable. So I wouldn't say that is a material desire. So we just continue serving and observe, observe, sorry, observe ourselves whether what is it that we like about the service. Is the appreciation we get after the service? Or is it the absorption we get in service? And if you get absorption, then what you do that service more and more is healthy. It will connect us with Krishna more and more. Okay, thank you. Yes, I think we had a question. Oh, 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 okay. Yeah. Ah, uh, Prabhupada's concession from sixty-four to sixteen was it audacity? Mm, I don't know whether you can call it audacity. Because actually, if you see in the Gaudiya Mood also sixty-four round chanting was for people who were sannyasis who were not doing any preaching. It is not that 60, even today we go to the Gaudiya they don't have 64 rounds every day. And they had, they had 64 rounds, what Dr. Talk specifically said was that anybody who doesn't chant 64 rounds is fallen. But 64 rounds was not the initiation requirement. So Prabhupada basically, in the moment started, it was also like people were withdrawing from the world entirely, just living uh, within their own, uh, living within the movement itself and most of them did not have any other occupational duties to do. See, Prabhupada himself uh, did not take a vow to chant 64. Prabhupada did not chant 64 on every day. So, I wouldn't call that, that is a little dicey example. The, the point which Prabhupada was making was that he was extending himself to make the process of bhakti accessible. So, that extension definitely I would say a much bigger example of what I said would be the very fact that Prabhupada gave initiation to people who had no knowledge of Krishna, who had no, no, no culture at all, whose only regulated principle was to break all the regulated principles. <laughs> 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 so that is far greater example of Prabhupada's uh, devotion or asati. So Prabhupada's giving, extending his mercy, going at the age of 70 abroad to America and then traveling across the world, all that is definitely Prabhupada is an excellent example of uh, devotional audacity. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, what do we do? Yes? Okay. How can we absorb in Krishna? It's, a, it's again, as I said, conscientious. When the mind wanders, just get it back. It wanders, get it back. So as we do it, we start connecting with Krishna. So the mind has this idea that, oh, this is so nice, this is so nice, this is so nice. I want to watch this, I want to see this, I want to touch this, I want to eat this. The mind has various ideas of what is enjoyable. But, Actually, this Krishna who is supremely relishable, supremely enjoyable. So, imagine if there is a computer or a phone or a device which is programmed. Now, a device can be programmed in any way, it can be programmed wrong also. So, a device can be programmed if it sees red color, it says this is red. It can recognize. But if you just change the programming, it may say, it says it sees red color, it says this is blue. The, com the pro computer or the phone doesn't recognize red or blue. It just responds to a program. So what has happened? Our mind has been programmed wrong. So as because it is programmed wrong, as soon as it sees anything worldly, this is so enjoyable, this is so enjoyable, this is so enjoyable, this is so enjoyable. But in real life, it's like saying, oh, red is blue. So our mind, because of the wrong programming, gets very attracted to worldly things. And that's how we get distracted from Krishna. That's how we're not able to absorb ourselves in Krishna. But, okay, even if we feel like let's attract to focus on Krishna. When we try to connect with Krishna, 
when we say read about Krishna, like you are doing now, hear about Krishna, mm-hmm. do various things related to Krishna, gradually by doing these inside experiences, hey, this is fun, this is nice. In fact, this makes me more peaceful and joyful. And so many of the other things that the world talks about. Then I have to start getting that conviction. That's how we can okay. Even if mind says this, mind says that, it will be absorbed. So just by doing what we are doing as well as we can, the service of Krishna, gradually get absorption. Okay? Thank you. Oh. Then what time should we go on? <laughs> okay, yes. Hmm. Okay, if you did not think of ourselves as great or small, how should you think of ourselves? We are all parts of Krishna, we are all uh, servants of Krishna, we are all going to serve Krishna. So, in that sense, every one of us is special because each of us has a relationship with Krishna, each of us is loved by Krishna. But our specialness comes from Krishna, not from us itself. Even if we have some special abilities, we have been given those by Krishna. So, we think of ourselves as servants of Krishna. And as servants of Krishna, we can see, okay, what is, is there any special ability that Krishna has given me? Is there something which I can do good? And recognizing that, yes, I can do this well, that is not humility, that is not, that is not against humility, that is not evil. If we remember that, our ability comes from Krishna. So if we see our ability as a gift, then seeing our ability also will make us proud. But if we see our ability as our ability alone, then it can make us proud. But if we don't see any ability at all in ourselves, then that will make us feel inferior and make us feel insecure. So we see ourselves as Krishna service, and then we see what all Krishna has given us. That way, we see that we are special because Krishna loves us. We are special because Krishna has given us some gifts. Mm. And we can use those gifts in His service. Okay? Thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Initially or towards the end? Um, did Okay. This is not related to the class, isn't it? Okay, yeah, I got to find. Did Ashwatthama flee from the battle in, uh, in Kurukshetra? Yes. On the 15th day, when Drona fell, after that, at that time, initially before that, Ashwatthama had been fighting with, I think, Hathot Kach. No, not with other. With some other warrior, and it got severely wounded. It got wounded, so he had retreated to treat himself and recover. And when he came back, at that time, he found that uh, the all the Kauravas were running away. So what happened? And he said that uh, Drona has been killed. And when he heard about how Drona had been killed, he was got very angry. So he charged towards the battlefield and he used. His most powerful weapon, the Narayana Astra. And it was a weapon that could not be countered. So Krishna told everyone, just get off your chariots and offer obeisances. And the Narayana Astra just went above them and did not hurt anyone. Then he shot another unstoppable weapon. But Krishna again dodged that. And when both his most powerful weapons were foiled, he just felt so completely shattered. First his father had been killed and now his best weapons were foiled. All is illusion, nothing works in this world, everything is illusion. Same as he just ran away from there. So he ran away because he felt completely frustrated at that time. And now because eventually on the 18th day, when, when Shalya fell, when all the Kauravas fell one by one, that time also he fled. And later on he saw Duryodhan. <clears throat> Duryodhana had been wounded in the fight against Bhishma, fatally, Bhima, fatally wounded. So he, in the 15th day he once ran and 18th day also he again ran. Because he just felt completely frustrated at not being able to succeed in the war. 
I'll be completely admitting, admitting repeated failures in the world. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, from which uh, uh, like version of Mahabharata do you recommend for reading? Okay. I think if there's any question related to the topic, we can talk. Otherwise, the last question will stop. Now we can talk on to one of them. That's the last question. So we sometimes explain spontaneous devotion while we are practicing sadhana mukti also. So can we have glimpses of Ravana in Vaidhi? Yeah, see there are technical classifications or categorizations. And one basic system in taxonomy is that taxon taxonomy is a system of classification, the study of classification, or how systems are made. The taxonomy never accurately reflects reality. Hmm. Say on the map, we say this is India, this is China, this is Pakistan. But if you actually go there, there is no need dividing line over there. Now, of course, in America, they are trying to construct a wall, a big wall over there. But that's because it is not, so the geography seems very systematic, but the reality is much more complex. So, generally, if we get too caught in terminology, that Vaithi and Raganuga, that can often, that classification, that connection, uh, all that can lead to a lot of confusion. But let's focus on the essential principle. The essential principle is that Maam Icham Tum Krishna says that by sadhana, by fixing the mind on him, our attraction to him will increase. Uh, so that principle, whether it is Ravanuga Bhakti as it is traditionally conceived in the, in the Bhakti Samad Sindhu, that the devotee thinks about some Ragatmika Bhakta, and focuses on that devotee and that's how it cultivates that mood. But the idea is spontaneity comes. So for us also, as we do discipline devotion, spontaneity, there are moments of spontaneity. And at those moments will increase more and more as we keep practicing bhakti. So whether you want to classify technically this is Vaiti and that as Ravanuga, well that could we can go into technicalities of technicalities of uh, the Bhakti Samad Sindhu. And look at that. So we could conceivably say that we are getting glimpses of what is way advanced before class, right now. So yes, the process of bhakti is progressive, but during this progression, sometimes our consciousness may go way ahead of where we are, and sometimes our consciousness may go way behind where we are also. Sometimes we come to a temple and we feel nothing. Feel like I'm stone-hearted. I don't have any devotion at all. And sometimes we come to the temple and we feel such ecstasy, we feel as if I have no pure devotion. So it's not either zero devotion nor pure devotion. We are somewhere in between. See, but we just keep applying ourselves, then we move towards towards uh, the culmination, whether it is the Vaidhi Bhakti or Ravana Bhakti, the culmination is Bhava and Prema, and we move towards that batch. Okay. Thank you very much. Prantra Shri Bhagavatam Ki Shri Lakhapad Ki Kaur Bhakta Vrindaki Dagaur Kumar